everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Alan. On behalf of the crew of the show, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. You know, as we move into the, the millennium, the year 2000, I mean, there seems to be so much force and so much power coming into all our lives. And, and there there's also seems to be the forces of division, of separation, kind of rising up also out of that. And there seems almost like a battle between division and oneness, between conflict and love. And tonight we're honored to have with us people who travel the world bringing that experience of, of oneness, of connectedness, against separation, against division. They just bring it to, on an international level to, to anybody who's willing to listen. I mean, tonight we have with us uh, Kevin Ryerson, who is a seminal figure in the spiritual movement. He's an expert intuitive. I think they use the word intuitive now. In, in Ten years ago, they used to work, use the word psychic. Uh, he's a trans channel. He's an author. Uh, his book, Spirit Communication, The Soul's Path, is one of the most inspirational books that came along to, to rise so many of us into a new level, into an inspiration of, of reaching for more love and more consciousness. He's a leader of, of seminar retreats and workshops to sacred sites. He just travels the world bringing that message of love, the vibration of love, the experience of love, just to anyone who's willing to listen. And it's just an extraordinary grace and, and beauty for us to, to have Kevin with us tonight. And we also have a local person from Santa Barbara, Laurieann David, who's another international uh, celebrity in the sense that she's an acclaimed musical artist. And she's a true Renaissance woman. She does so many incredible things in terms of bringing that light and love out in every way, in every way possible. I mean, one of her major uh, tenets is that she is a conduit of the life force, of that love made manifest. And tonight she's going to bring that love and manifest that love through her drumming and through her explanation of her drumming and, and her combination of drumming in the I Ching. So tonight's show should really be another lift for all of us to, to come into that experience of love and, and to really be examples in this world against the division. Whatever way we think or anybody is watching the show that there is some opposing force to them, there isn't. There's really just love, there's really just brotherhood and sisterhood, and it's time that we all came into that experience more and more. So please just settle into tonight's show, and with Kevin and Laurieann, I think you're going to have an extraordinary experience. So as we normally do with this chime, just to calm everybody down, whatever you've done today, let it go. Just try to meditate for a few minutes or 30 seconds or a minute, and just settle into that heart space. And I think it'll really be touched tonight again. So please join me. Thank you. Uh, we're going to begin tonight's show with Laurie Ann David doing the I Ching Pattern Drumming Part 1, and we're going to have Part 2 later with uh, some other wonderful uh, instruments of love. So uh, whenever you're ready, the I Ching Pattern Drumming Part 1 with Laurie Ann. The I Ching, or Book of Changes, is an ancient tool of Chinese wisdom used for self-knowledge and divination. It combines all of the forces of universal energies and the basic tenets of life force and life change in rhythm. The book is made up of many patterns based around eight elements of universal forces, and these patterns are combined to give us intuition, as you might call it, and knowledge about ourselves in the world of about us in the patterns. Life is about cycles, life is about change, and life is about rhythms. And what we've done with our drumming in the I Ching pattern drumming is taken the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching and put them into different patterns. 
the I Ching, there are many uh, versions and translations of the book. The each of the uh, hexagrams are a series of um, broken and solid lines, and we've taken that into a single and a double beat. You can see in the um, board that we've presented how those can translate into music. And I'd like to show you a little bit, bit about how we've taken the patterns and actually turned them into a rhythm that one can use as a meditation. For example, the first one, we can see the pattern of water are two, dotted, two dots and then a solid line and then two dots. So it would sound something like this. So we've taken those eight universal forces, earth, fire, heaven, water, lake, mountain, wind, and combined them together. And so a number of them together might sound something like this. The pattern drumming with the I Ching is also based about um, transformational work in your brain state going from theta and alpha brain waves. You can actually move into a deep state of trance and meditation after about 13, 15 minutes. So what we've tried to accomplish with the pattern drumming is to take the elements of nature through the hexagrams and turn it into um, a meditative state through our drumming. So I'd like to show you now one of the pieces that we've composed, and we call it the I Ching Symphony. A woman, Melinda Maxfield, has done a lot to further this work, and this is a piece that we've worked on, and I'd like to play it for you now. So just close your eyes and sit back and relax. Take a little bit of an inner journey.
when this is sustained for a long period of time, you can see the wonderful relaxed state. When we come back in the next set, we'll be adding bells, click sticks, and rattle, and two other musicians to show you the other combinations and pieces of work that we can do with I Ching pattern drumming. Wow, thank you, Laurie, and that was beautiful. We're on the set now with Kevin Ragerson. Welcome, Kevin. Okay, Thanks thank for you. coming. So for people who are not familiar with your work, mm -hmm. the, the two or three that mm -hmm. are still out there, <laughs> <laughs> why don't you go into a little bit how you got started mm -hmm. in this and then how, what trans-channeling is mm -hmm. and what you know, a, an intuitive or a psychic mm -hmm. is, and just explain that as we start. Okay, um, <clears throat> sort of the mini autobiography is that uh, <laughs> I like to say that, uh, like Bill Cosby, I started out as a child. I, <laughs> I had an, a strong interest in extrasensory perception. Uh, I was literally born and raised in Sandusky, Ohio, so I'm sort of from the Midwest. And um, as early as, uh, for instance, as high school, I had formed an ESP club in uh, high school and was interested really in the study of psi, which is the scientific term for the investigation of uh, psychic phenomena. Um, however, uh, having looked into things like Zener cards, tarot cards, et cetera, et cetera, and finding them effective tools uh, for heightening consciousness uh, and interpersonal growth, is really when I came across the Edgar Casey readings that I began taking a deeper interest in such things as altered states of consciousness uh, and working with very, very profound forms of meditation. It was in an Edgar Casey uh, study group that I actually began working with the meditations that then in turn led to the practice of the altered states of consciousness associated with channeling. Um, I had spent four years... And channeling being? Okay. Uh, channeling being the ability of a person to set aside the rational, critical faculties, putting those to one side and entering into an intuitive state or an altered state of consciousness that allows other levels of consciousness to speak through. Um, we see this in things like hypnosis. Uh, we see the suggested benefits, for instance, through the EEG drumming, which we had the privilege to participate in. Um, and when a person goes into those intuitive resources, they are tapping into what science now begins to refer to as our emotional intelligence. And, it, and it's in our emotional intelligence or in the inner psychic life that a great deal of the problem solving occurs. Uh, for instance, Dr. William Kautz, uh, formerly of SRI, uh, points out that 82% of what we consider to be scientific breakthroughs are really intuitive breakthroughs. Uh, what is known as the benzene ring or the carbon ring, which is the fundamental building block of life, was discovered <clears throat> by the scientist when he dreamed of an ancient Native American symbol of a serpent consuming its own tail. He then mm. was able to conceive of the monocule as being in a spiral form. So people enter in and out of channeling states or altered states of consciousness all the time. For instance, uh, daydreaming. You might think of not as disassociating from the logical process, but going even deeper into mm -hmm. an altered state of consciousness. Now, in my case, I like to think of myself as sort of a 21st century shaman <laughs> because uh, as anyone who saw uh, Shirley MacLaine's miniseries Out on a Limb, uh, they were able to see th the process of channeling as I work with it. Um, Edgar Casey would go into an altered state and contact what was called the higher self, that even though he only had a sixth grade 19th century education, he could lecture and discourse on everything from um, medicine to geometry to geography. In that state. In that altered state of right. consciousness. And in my case, it's a little bit more like what is referred to as the Seth material, uh, whereby it is what is referred to as ancestral intelligence speaking through. This is the idea that the human soul, uh, the human personality, can survive in the post-mortem experience or survive what we refer to as death and dying and be able to communicate back through in a manner that is relevant to the issues that a person may put to those particular ancestral intelligences. This, of course, uh, anyone who is familiar with Shirley MacLaine's book, Out on a Limb, was almost sort of like documented by Shirley. Shirley was looking at this as a, as a person And you were the one who basically brought her into 
all this. <laughs> I'm not you so, were a vehicle for you, it. You know, in a way, it's almost like Shirley MacLaine brings everybody into everything that she does. But but uh -huh. the but the joke between us is is that uh, people go, well, Shirley MacLaine made you famous. But no, our joke is, is that I made Shirley MacLaine famous in my field. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay, which is the field of parapsychology. Right. right. Uh, but in her book, Out on a Limb, uh, basically, she went into communication with one of these ancestral intelligences called... Through you. Uh, through yours truly. Right. Um, this was the intelligence referred to as Tom McPherson, uh, who describes himself as an Irishman from the Shakespearean time periods. Shirley, always referring to herself as a gypsy or someone whose first home was on the stage, uh, had an immediate rapport with him. And in that, uh, she went into this very, very deep philosophical... Uh, discussions with Tom McPherson, drawing on his knowledge of the spirit, drawing on his knowledge of what occurs to the soul, what, you know, who are we, where are we going, and how do we get there, uh, such things as past lives. But the core conversation she had was a leap forward that she wanted to make in her own art form in cinema. Hmm. And, and that is probably the most famous discussion that she had with him. Because in it, Tom McPherson, as an ancestral intelligence, and what occurs in the phenomenon of channeling, did not make a series of predictions that she was going to, for instance, just win the Oscar. It was more about her examining her inner motivations, her inner spiritual life, as to why she should take the risk of the film part in terms of endearment, because everyone was cautioning her against that. That, that this was a role she was going to have to play older, which was, at that time, was the right, equivalent of, wanted, right. it was considered to right. be career suicide. But when she realized that that is when women are the most interesting, that is when they are the most powerful in their lives, that that role is now acknowledged as having redefined the way cinema is practiced and has extended the careers of such people, such as Jessica Tandy, mm -hmm. who went on to win her Oscar, in uh, Driving Miss Daisy, and it mm -hmm. is all traced back to that single role and that conversation with that particular ancestral mm. intelligence, Tom McPherson. So channeling is a tool or resource for people to go inside of themselves into an inner problem-solving process from their inner psychic So, makeup. I mean, every different person who comes before you for that type of experience, would they get a different person or does Tom McPherson do everybody? <laughs> well, it's basically... I do channel other ancestral intelligences, okay, and sometimes you need a scorecard to keep track of things, right. <laughs> but it's, uh, um, uh, one of the jokes is, is that on my card, my business card, it says Kevin Ryerson and Company. Well, right, the, the company are the ancestral intelligences right. that speak through. So, I mean, some people who've been on the show channel what they call masters or... Yes. Mm -hmm. And do you channel also the masters or is it just limited mm -hmm. to ancestral intelligence mm -hmm. for that particular mm -hmm. person? Well, it, what it is is that... Uh, there are some channels who describe hierarchies in the postmortem experience. You know, like, well, you have God, you have uh, what are referred to as master teachers, you have what are referred to as guides and teachers. And in my belief, um, there may be such a hierarchy because of human needs, but I think it functions more like a hologram. And if you were to look at the historical ancestral intelligences that speak through, probably the entity that Shirley referred to in her book as the entity John, uh, who it has been suggested may be John, uh, who is a student of the Essene systems of thought, and some people suggest that he may have been the person who authored the book of Revelations. So in other words, your way of looking at it is a little different than others. There isn't that hierarchical scheme, there's just mm -hmm. knowledge that comes through in whatever form would be best suited to that particular person? Oh, well, the, when, I'm a, when I'm working in a, in a retreat situation with what's called guys and teachers, what I inform people is, is that you have guys and teachers. Uh, you have, for instance, guides and teachers help you with your emotions. Uh, you have them what's called a master teacher who works with what is called your higher self, your higher inspirations. And then the chart goes all the way up, for instance, to say angels and archangels, okay? And then finally, you have the big cheese called God, <laughs> right. okay? And in reality, I encourage people to actually eliminate the middleman and always go directly to God. Then God will send you an appropriate messenger. Now, in Shirley's case, when she was first speaking with John, John's philosophy was so profound for her that it literally went right over her head. And she had a greater comfort zone with Tom McPherson uh, because of his work on the Shakespearean stage, and he's very earthy. So Tom could get across points in the dialogue that, for instance, at Shirley, where she was at that time, mm -hmm. so sort of everyone needed to would grow be into. different in essence. Yes, yeah. yes. In other words, it's unique to each individual, but they all have a a fundamentally the same, the same message. Yes. And the message is. 
The message is God is love. love. I mean, I said, <laughs> <laughs> okay. We work, there we work we on go. that. Okay, right, you know. Right. Yeah, I mean, if it. Jesus was to come back, like Mark Twain said, if he was to come back as anything, it wouldn't be as a Christian. But right. if Jesus, when <laughs> All right, we're <laughs> off the air in a few stations. Thank you. And, <laughs> and there are hit squads out. <laughs> on, he said it, not me. So. Okay. And it always bears repeating. But the, the thing about the God is love is very simple. It's the shortest passage in the Judeo-Christian Bible other than Jesus wept. And my belief is that Jesus wept because he goes, you know, he says, I don't understand. You know, I buy books, I heal people, I raise people from the dead, I raise myself from the dead. They still can't get it straight. God right. is love. Right. And, and why do you think that is for a human being? Why do you think that's a difficult connection? Why do you think all the, you know, the separations happen, be it religion, be it color, be it... I mean, what, what happens when we come into this? <laughs> if you could go on that for a while. Well, we got... This is a 12-hour show. If no. <laughs> It, well, I will try to solve in a few moments what philosophers have been working on for thousands of years. Okay? But you've been working on it for a long time, so uh, yeah, I know uh, you yeah. can see And this. I'm still working on it. <laughs> right. I mean, if you, if you take the parables, if you draw on all the great scriptures, whether it's the Judeo-Christian Bible, whether it's the Rig Vedas, whether it's the Barda, whether it's the Egyptian book of he who's coming forth into the light of the day, it always speaks of the pearl of great price. And basically, I think that what it is is that it always talks about how the deity or the substance of human knowledge is always hidden. And in my opinion... Because it was set up that way in essence. In, in essence, I think that it is hidden only in the sense that it's hide in plain sight. And so therefore, when we seek it, it really is within us. It really is within us. And it is the pearl of great price. In fact, I think that when people work with meditation, as you encourage them to do so, I look at love as what I refer to as the alchemical emotion. Mm -hmm. um, it's the experience. It's, it, it, it's, it's the, the realization. It's, it's, the, ex the it's the experience of it, and I really feel that love has two components to it. I, I think that it has uh, an active component called joy, and I think that it has a yin component, okay, a yin component called sorrow. Hmm. And, and I believe that as what John said, John said that one drop of joy transforms oceans of fear, anger, and jealousy. Mm -hmm. Fear, anger, and jealousy. And that sorrow should not be so associated so much with grief or pain, that it really is the human ability to empty yourself out to receive the next level of joy. And this is the really core, the core message that spirit brings through. So in, in your work, what tools do you use? You, you mentioned meditation. So when you lead, mm -hmm. I mean, you go all over the world to the mm -hmm. sacred sites mm -hmm. and, and just all over. Mm -hmm. uh, when you sit down in a workshop, mm -hmm. how do you bring that mm -hmm. experience to people or, okay. or be a vehicle for bringing okay. that experience? Um, when I'm working, um, <laughs> for years, um, for years, um, I had taught in a fairly typical seminar format, you know, whether that was, you know, at the Hilton or whether that was at, um, you know, uh, in a person's home, which is one of my preferences. I always tried to work on an intimate scale. But I began to realize that um, these were not environments that were completely, in my opinion, conducive to bringing out the depth of the ancestral intelligence for people. And I, I really even ask myself, why do I channel all these different ancestors? Uh, there's Tom McPherson, there's uh, the entity John, there's an entity called Antunre, who's an old Egyptian who speaks through. And eventually, what I began to do to expand my work uh, and to create an authentic experience for people was to go to, as you mentioned, to what we refer to as sacred sites. For instance, uh, we will go to Ireland, and Tom McPherson will speak through. And one of the climaxes of that journey is to experience Celtic drumming in the inner circle of Stonehenge. Mm. And when you have a group of dedicated people, we can go into Stonehenge. There are no tourists or anything. It's at sunset with a full moon rising. And it creates an extremely natural cathedral uh, in which people can go into a personal vision quest. Or if we go to Egypt, uh, we will be in Egypt and it will create a very, very intense spiritual vision quest for people that may for, be for some people a once-in-a-lifetime experience. But it will be with three hours of private time inside the Great Pyramid, inside the King's Chamber, 
and we will work with Egyptian chanting or e Nubian drumming, sacred and indigenous to the site. Now this is not the idea of going back into the past, trying to bring something beneficial into the future. It is really learning how intimately we are connected to the earth, to the sacred sites, and that the ancestral intelligences have gifts for us and that they welcome us into the sacred. And it's what I refer to as being a citizen in the New Jerusalem or being a citizen in the city of God. So when, when you lead these workshops, do you find that the actual s site has a certain type of energy, a more energy, or is it just almost psychological that people travel, they mm -hmm. leave their habitual life mm -hmm. behind? It, it's, it's, Do you know what I mean? Is, yeah. is it the site or is it like the person's conception of the site? It, it's, it's a combination of all of the above. Uh, I think that the skeptic, for instance, could go to the site, but if they appreciate, say, the insights of a person such as Joseph Campbell, it's, it's the history of the site. It's the fact that it's rich in ancestral experience. Um, if but is that is that a mental picture, or is that an you know is that actual an energetic thing, or do you have to put it through the filter of your concepts in mind? In other words, if I took Joseph Campbell to the side of the set and said, "This is where you know Stonehenge used to," be, you know, if I could convince him, <laughs> okay. would would he would the energy for him would his openness be there? In your experience, because yes. you travel the okay. world with thousands and thousands of people. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe I can give you the experience of a person who, who I just worked with. Uh, I was introduced uh, to my good fortune uh, to uh, Gary Zukov, okay, who is the author of The Dancing Wooly Masters, which was a literally, if you'll pardon my pun, a turning point uh, in my life, and um, his book The Seed of the Salt, which I consider a book remarkably parallel to other things that yours truly brings through. And in approaching Gary, I was introduced to him by Gary's long-term friend, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove, who has a PhD from Berkeley in parapsychology. And we were putting together what we refer to as the Sacred Sight School of Consciousness. And when we first approached Gary, it was a mystery to him what his attraction to si such a site would be, because Gary's a notorious futurist. I mean, he, he puts it out there all the time that he does not draw on the past. He draws on the future for his inspiration. But something about the nature of the site was an inspiration to him, and independent of his subjective beliefs, he felt that he had some extraordinary breakthroughs due to the energy of the site, mm. whether, whether it was the beauty, the spiritual energy that is, that is literally present, that the shamans draw on for healing. It, it happens independent of the subjective belief system. And that, and that has been your experience, too, that there's yes. something happening in these sites, in these yes. places that's yes. different than other places. That is correct. Well, wow, that's fantastic. All right, you know, maybe we'll just hear some drumming now, and then we'll come back and, and talk to Kevin more about the sacred sites and the schools and maybe the combination or the, or the, the coming together of, of science and psychology and mm -hmm. spirit and spiritualism. So what we'll have now is uh, Lori Ann again and, and Vina Lefferts and Marshall Lefferts doing the I Ching Pattern Drumming Part 2. So whenever you guys are ready, please.
Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. We're back on the set with Kevin. So do you see in your travels that, that the synthesis between like technology and science and spirituality starting to come together where there is no conflict and separation as there seemingly <laughs> is most of the time? You know, I think, uh, I think there never has been, you know, a conflict or a separation. It, it, it seems to be the human need, you know, for some kind of drama and overcoming as though that there was a conflict that existed. I mean, if you really take the great thinkers, say like Einstein, who, who basically said the most important thing a person can feel is a sense of wonder, uh, and where he literally says that imagination is more important than knowledge, you can see that there is no conflict. It's, it's, it's something that is generated by our society um, I think we have now begun to truly enter into what has been referred to uh, initially by Father Andrew Greeley, who did uh, work at Chicago University, and was the first one to really begin to map the demographics of what we refer to as the holistic thinkers of the New Age. Um, but now a new research coming out of the Institute of Noetic Sciences points out that there is an entire phenomena in what we now refer to as sort of the post-modern uh, era as we go into the millennium of what he refers to as the cultural creatives. Uh, the cultural creatives, the demographics, make up some 45 million people who feel that they are working with, they, with what they call the new realism. And what they are looking for is authenticity. And, and that to deny the phenomena and the, and the need of, of spirit, you know, in the workplace, of spirit uh, in the home life, that this core value, uh, if you will, is being sought after by 45 million people in this country. Um, on occasion, for instance, uh, someone will interview me and they will say, well, you know, how does it feel being in a, in a minority, you know, of people who believe in reincarnation? And the first thing I'll point out is that I said, well, Father Andrew Greeley's work reveals that 25% of these people in this country believe in reincarnation, and over 92% of them believe in some type of post-mortem experience. But the other thing is, is that I live in the majority world, in that over three-quarters of the people on the planet believe in reincarnation. <laughs> And what I point out to people, for instance, in the corporate experience or the corporate environment is that unless they get in touch with their fundamental emotional intelligence and their intuition and these kinds of beliefs, we will not be able to compete <clears throat> in the emerging global markets. Uh, we will be out of touch of the core of what it is that makes the majority world work. Now, what the new paradigm that's emerging. Yes. And so you were saying we've spent some time together the last mm -hmm. few days that almost now you consider yourself more a futurist which is again just using mm -hmm. English mm -hmm. words mm -hmm. and when you say that word how mm -hmm. would you describe it and, and what would you say are the, are the new paradigms mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are coming mm -hmm. into the well well the the concept of, of intuition and futurism has its roots in in traditional words such as psychic and such as prophecy um, and simply put um, the concept of prophets, for instance, is, is, is very, very misunderstood. Maybe this will get us back on the air on some of those stations a little right. earlier. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> if you haven't shut us off, so, listen carefully. He's trying to make amends. Okay, so now it's <laughs> time to listen up, folks. So anyway, uh, prophets, for instance, were people who did not necessarily just go about and somehow predict uh, some future disaster in relationship to people's inappropriate behavior. What it was is that when it was said, when people did not keep the laws or the rules or the revelations of the prophets, is why these disastrous social consequences would occur. And really what the rules of the prophets are, and that's some very narrow, stringent uh, moral code, uh, per se, in spite of what we see going on in Congress at the moment, um, they really were ways in which people could live their lives in, in a civil manner, in a socializing manner, uh, ways in which they could raise food abundantly, ways in which they could be intercooperative as a yeah, people. Yeah, collaborative in some way, it, it, shape, or form. Exactly. Right. And I really feel that it was in the context of that history about the issue of prophecy that, if anything, we have entered into, in a period of time, what is referred to as the time of Jonah. This is one of the classic prophecies given by uh, Yeshua, or Jesus, uh, which was that the end generation, the millennial generation, um, would receive the sign of Jonah. 
Now, theologically, it's been interpreted as the idea of three days spent in the tomb and then the resurrection. However, that does not explain it, because when you look at the book of Jonah, what occurred is that Jonah was a reluctant prophet. Um, he sought to flee from that particular revelation. Um, so therefore, he was then had the experience, the famous experience of being swallowed by the great fish or the whale, then being regenerated, okay, because it's, if these are archetypal, when he went and prophesied to the city, the city changed the way that the people were living. <clears throat> they were changed and they lived better lives and then when the city didn't fall, he thought he was a failure. <laughs> but God spoke to him and said that when you live your life aligned with the laws of the prophet, people prosper. Now today, with the intuition and futurism, the new prophets, whether you look at people like Edgar Cayce, who was an intuitive, he was a psychic, and the word psychic means of the mind and of the soul. If you just took his, what I refer to as his Atlantean myth uh, of saying that if people making choices about their lifestyles the way they did in the myth of the story about Atlantis, and if they become too dependent on technology the way that the Atlanteans became de dependent on technology involving crystals, it can lead to disruption of man's and humanity's and women's relationships to the ecology and the environment to the point where it can have a destructive or a Shiva-like effect or a Kali-like effect on man's civilization. Kali meaning <clears throat> the goddess of the, destruction. It, right, okay. Yes, uh, the, <clears throat> the Shekinah or the, the destructive forces that are pre-existing in, in the balance in nature. And if you look now at the new social prophets, uh, people such as Carl Sagan, it is now the scientists who are saying that if we do not change our relationship to the ecology, we will bring about something similar to what occurred in the Atlantean myth with global warming, the thinning of the ozone layer, and these are choices that we can make, that people can make now at this point in time. So the new intuitives, the new social prophets, if you will, <clears throat> and the new futurism is looking how can we restore that balance. It is my belief that we are succeeding in that. On an esoteric level, <clears throat> the phenomena that was predicted by the social scientist Jose Arguellos called the harmonic convergence, where millions of people uh, were encouraged by his studies of the Mayan calendars to go to the great sacred sites and begin to meditate and through changing their thoughts and to begin to trigger what is referred to as the hundredth monkey effect per se. 1987 was considered to be a crucial turning point where people have now begun to change their lifestyle choices in relationship to things like the environment. And these things are not punitive. I think that uh, C.G. Jung <clears throat> summarized it well when in studying collective dreaming, he was not only able to predict World War II, he was able to predict human ability to go beyond war because he said, there will come a great crisis it will probably occur in the environment that will be able to unify humanity to go beyond war. And that's what these challenges are. Now, there are a lot of apocalyptic pr prophets or, or prophecies at <laughs> yes. this time. Yes. And your feeling is because of this change and because of the new paradigm that's coming in, yes. that th those prophecies will probably not take effect because the human condition is like mm -hmm. raising its level, mm -hmm. so that is not part of what has to be done to balance out mm -hmm. the forces of nature, in a sense. I, I, would, I would say most definitely. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of what I refer to as a pragmatic utopian. Um, I, I believe that when we, when we meditate, uh, when, we, when we go into altered states of consciousness, when we go to sacred sites, or whether it's just even in the home, I like to think of people going to sacred sites, whether it's Stonehenge or whether it's the pyramids, or even in my native Ohio, the Serpent Mound, okay, uh, built by the um, Indinas peoples or the Hopewell culture. Um, it's like acupuncture for the planet is the mm. best way to think of the sacred sites. It's like going to the chakras of the planet and harmonizing once again with nature so that we can bring that into our lives and into the choices that we are making as a people reclaiming spirituality. And in that, uh, that's what the new millennium is about. That's what the, the changing from the, the, uh, the Piscean age into the Aquarian age, yes. in essence, is going from like the guilt and fear into the love and collaborative 
movement. Yes, it's again, it's the idea, I think that if people can find <clears throat> that one drop of joy, you know, in their lives, that we're shifting in spiritual terms from being karmically oriented to dharmically oriented. Uh, I Which often, means, for well, those who are not well, that, that's, by I, I, I like to bring this one up because <laughs> many people's first breakthrough is the idea of karma, that, that the actions in their lives is that it's a form of spiritual personal accountability, that what you put out is what comes back to you as you sow, so shall you reap, and that the law of karma is merely the law of return. But I find that people concentrate so much on karma as the idea of a system of just, justice or punishment or reward that they miss its uh, twin soul word, which is dharma. Because uh, what dharma is, is dharma is the special, unique ability that a person comes into this lifetime with. Um, it's that special, unique service that they can do. Someone once said, service is the, do, is, is service is the rent we pay for being on the planet. And basically, since the landlord wants to back you up <laughs> and right. give you every break, the bottom line is, is that by discovering your dharma, the special service, the thing that makes you unique, and those are things that we can use meditation for, to find that thing that we love to do, to find that joy, that is where we begin to really discover <clears throat> about God is love. Because if you find that thing you love to do, that talent, then it becomes self-sustaining and that is your dharma. So how would you, what would you recommend to people who are in their lives with their families, the mortgages, the whole, <laughs> the whole nine yes. yards here, mm -hmm. certainly in the Western, mm -hmm. Western world, mm -hmm. uh, who, who maybe can't go to the sacred sites, mm -hmm. what could they do in their lives to, mm -hmm. to awaken that joy, mm -hmm. to, to bring them into that experience? Well, <clears throat> um, I'm certain that people have been exposed to things such as uh, feng shui, okay? Um, and, and the thing to remember is, is that everything, for instance, about sacred sites merely augment what is natural to the person to begin with. And so things like um, feng shui, which is the Chinese art of the placement of objects in the home, uh, the choices we make about our health care, uh, for instance, uh, maybe visiting a, a, a doctor of oriental medicine, such as you know, acupuncture, uh, acupressure, and shift in a philosophy that rather than waiting until you're in a health crisis to go and see a physician, go to a person who, who maintains the balance of the mind, the body, and the spirit. Rather than necessarily going to the gym for strength training only, <clears throat> maybe work with yoga, uh, which m merges the mind, the body, and the spirit. And that way, the home, the workplace, the recreational time, gradually all of it becomes sacred. Right. And, and so therefore, if you will, it is the creation of the sacred or the manifestation of the sacred. And simply the suggestion, you know, of the idea of the sacred sites is that if you want, you know, a great adventure, why not make it the difference between being a tourist and a pilgrim, for instance. That a tourist is only concerned with their comfort. A traveler is willing to jettison their comfort in order to arrive at a destination, but to a pilgrim, the whole journey, the is, journey is the experience. Exactly. You know, it's interesting because at one time, we, a group of us were going to put together a calendar and it was going to be a sacred sites calendar, but mm. actually what it was, was that you'd open it up and there was a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, we, ha you know, we never ended up putting mm -hmm. it out because mm -hmm. a lot of things mm -hmm. just didn't work out. But mm -hmm. I mean, that was, you know, the point was, I mm -hmm. mean, so much we seek outside, mm -hmm. and if we can't get there, then mm -hmm. we can't have that experience, but that's, mm -hmm. that's lunacy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's an excuse we have for not really mm -hmm. having the experience because we are that love. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like we have to go somewhere to find it, mm -hmm. although it's not, you know, it's fun and it's, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's an interesting journey. Mm -hmm. But basically that's what we're made of. Oh, mo most definitely. It's, it, to, me, to, to me, if a person wants to get in touch with the sacred journey, they need to have what I call their moral compass, okay, because uh, the original term Epicurean, which unfortunately conjured because the Romans got old, but it conjures up the images yeah, of like a pig. excessive. <laughs> well, I was going to put it a little more delicately well, I, than that, but it, yeah. it's a we good graphic lost illustration. We most of our stations because okay, it was. so it doesn't matter okay. anymore. We'll have like a, a sacred cooking with Julia Child or right, something. Exactly. She but, lives uh, in town. Yes. <laughs> so we might see you tomorrow at coffee. Excellent, right? excellent. Yeah. But uh, the idea is, is that. Um, the idea is, is that the essence of what the person needs to seek 
uh, or what I suggest is, is to, to find that one drop of joy because joy transforms oceans of fear, anger, and jealousy. Right. And from that point in time, you can begin to pursue and find and work with your moral compass because what the Epicurious philosophy was, was very simple, is that humanity has a moral duty to be happy. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> to, its, that's its destiny. Exactly. Yeah. And the point of the matter is, is that if God is love, we are so conditioned that we think of life, uh, much as Tom McPherson put it, that we are meat, potato, and dessert people, and we think of joy as coming at the end of something. Whereas if it was authentic and God was with us, and if God is love, and joy is that yang component, that, that active component, that animating component. Yeah, the did manifestation we ever, of being human. Exactly. Did we ever think that joy should be there at the beginning of the process? <laughs> I always eat dessert first. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, you know, you ruin your appetite. But I get, you know, I can do it like 50 weeks a year. The two weeks I visit my parents, I got to eat right. You know? <laughs> because joy then becomes your moral compass. Because right, love. What, exactly. Yes, exactly. It feels better. And exactly. that's, it, you know, I mean, humans don't need a big story about it. It mm -hmm. just feels better. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to feel joy and feel love and do those actions that mm -hmm. bring that to you. It's just simple. Exactly. And once we have that, we wouldn't do the same things to the animals or the ocean. Mm -hmm. I mean, by the natural state of that joy manifesting and, and us feeling that connectedness, that oneness mm -hmm. with it, it just, we wouldn't treat each other, ourselves, the animals, the oceans, the trees, the way we do. Exactly, exactly. And that's, and and that's always what, you know, what, <laughs> what incredible person after another comes on and that, says, that, and then, or plays it, or, you know, and that's it. That's why we began the program where, you know, with God is love. <laughs> it's putting exactly. the whole secret. But it's like going into the undiscovered country or into the unknown country. The, the undiscovered country, the unknown country is not death. It, it is the future. And, and in that country, there are... There are no signs, there are no roads, but there are footprints. And it's the footprints of the ancestors who have been able to use that compass, you know, to guide them as they go into the future. And from that point in time, we're no longer reactionaries to the future. We, we are literally beginning to create it by manifesting the new human being. Uh, it's a little bit like Gary Zukov uses the term. We are becoming fundamentally what is universal about us as human beings. We are becoming universal human beings. So instead of us either experiencing or seeing the differences, the difference in color, the difference in heights, the difference in sexes, we're experiencing and seeing the, the, the essence of, of ourselves. Exactly. Which is all the same. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. And that's what's basically happening in the new paradigm. And that's what your work is about, pure, pure and simple. <laughs> yeah. Whatever other words you use to describe it wherever you go mm -hmm. and that's it to bring it, that into people's lives and more into your own life it, it's very much like uh buckminster fuller said or bucky fuller said he said that when we come to the millennium it will not be so much that we will be living in utopia but the all the resources to build utopia will be available to us and all we need to do is to build the bridges to those solutions and intuition is that bridge so you are literally just as the program's title suggests, you're bridging heaven and earth. That's a good way to end it. Why don't you, in the next 30 seconds, if you could, you know, you could say to the millions and millions of people watching, <laughs> okay. Kevin Ryerson wants to say to you, okay. go. Um, Kevin Ryerson is a channel. Kevin Ryerson would like to say to you, basically, uh, seek that one drop of joy. It transforms oceans of fear, anger, and jealousy. It makes fear become concern. Uh, it makes concern become compassion, and it's the moral duty to seek that inner dharma because it is not that you must flee some kind of end times. It's, it's the time to begin to join together and form the new human community. Thank you, Kevin. So that's fantastic. So thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Kevin, Lorianne, Vina, Marshall, and... It's just been an extraordinary experience for me, and we have shows lined up where, where more and more people are going to come in, and we certainly wanted to thank, in particular, uh, the people at the Montecito Del Mar Hotel who, who provided, uh, Kevin came in from New Mexico, and they provided him with an incredible suite, and you know, hopefully they're going to do it for our guests that come in from out of town, because guests are coming in from all over the country and the world to, to share their love with you. So 
It's just been wonderful to get all your cards and your letters. We're getting on in more cities. We're going to be on in San Diego pretty soon. It looks like Boston. Uh, one of the uh, crew members uh, is, just got back from a trip to Australia. He's sending it there, and we're hoping to be on in Australia. So thank you for watching. Thank you for your inspiration. God bless you. Good night. Find the love. Thank you.